Hi everybody, welcome to Simply Scuba and welcome to Ask Mark where I answer your questions. If you have any scuba diving questions, let us know down in the comments below. If you use the hashtag Ask Mark, it makes it a lot easier for us to find them and pop them in next week's show. Um, in today's show we're talking about ice diving, uh, Tech 40, twin sets, full face masks and snorkels as well as a few other bits and bobs. Um, so yeah, let's jump into the first question. The first question comes from uh, Lidowij uh, and they ask, ask Mark, uh, hey Mark, do you have any tips for getting into ice diving apart from doing the actual course? Uh, I do have a dry suit and the Aqualung Core Supreme Regulator set. Um, yeah, I mean, there are certain expeditions uh, that you can join on, but they're usually quite long. Uh, so you really have to take like a month off or something to uh, sort of go out and do that. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's just kind of finding people that do it. There's, there's usually dive centers, normally quite northern, um, who sort of, they're a bit more specialized in it. There are certain groups that you can get in contact with and just sort of gently sort of get into it with some really experienced divers. Um, the, the course itself is probably going to be the most valuable um, sort of starting point because, yeah, there's a lot of new and very different skills um, when you're diving in overhead environments. So definitely do that first. Dry suit. Yeah, yeah. Dry suit. Um, spare hoods as well a nice decent hood uh wet gloves are surprisingly good um i was diving up in the uh, the arctic circle and um i had a pair of dry gloves but they were separate dry gloves it's basically a dry glove but with a cuff seal and <clears throat> they were okay um but one of them leaked and yeah I can't remember which hand. One of my hands just went numb after the uh, after the dive. So then I switched to my seven mil gloves. Were they mitts? I feel like they were mitts. They were those kind of like three fingered claw um, kind of mitts, and they were wonderful. Much easier to put on because uh, you didn't have to worry about the latex seal and that kind of stuff. Now I have integrated um, dry gloves, but um, yeah, those seven mil mitts, they were very, very good. Um, the Aqualon Core Supreme Regulator set. So that is cold water certified. You can take that below 10 degrees Celsius. Um, it's not really what they're specifically designed to do. They'll do it but I'd be very careful with them. And what I probably do is I'll probably take it to my uh, local dive center um, or the place that's uh, sort of doing your ice diving cert and sort of well beforehand give them the regulators so that they can tweak them. Sometimes you can just make it just a little bit stiffer so they're less likely to free flow. Um, and when you're actually at the dive site, don't press that purge button uh, on the surface, just kind of have it in your mouth, maybe press the purge button, but be ready to uh, sort of shut the cylinder off because they can free flow quite readily. But Core Supreme, yeah, they are cold water certified, but th there are other better, more cold water regulators out there. It'll, it's one of those things where it'll do the job, just be careful with it, just so that it doesn't um, sort of free flow. But otherwise, yeah, um, find, find a decent dive center somewhere up north, somewhere that's does a fair amount of ice diving and um, yeah, sort of get friendly with them and just go go diving basically. Um, as I said, yeah, there are some expeditions. Um, was it waterproof? They used to do uh, sort of a few every year. Um, but yeah, so have a look around, have a look online, talk to some um, sort of scuba diving messaging boards and that, and uh, yeah, find a group of divers that do ice diving, and then they can teach you a few extra sort of tips and things and um, sort of get into their groove, and uh, yeah, it can be quite good fun. Question two comes from Eves, uh, and they ask, would you use a Peregrine for a Tech 40 dives? Um, is the three gas nitrox a real limitation compared to the five gas of the Perdix? Um, so the Shearwater Peregrine versus the Perdix at Tech 40. Um, so the Peregrine, Peregrine's a nitrox dive computer. Um, for Tech 40, you should be okay because that gives you a decent control. I don't know if it goes below 21%, but for Tech 40 it shouldn't be too much of an issue um three gas versus five gas i wouldn't worry too much at that kind of level but if you're thinking about progressing it's kind of worth going to the perdix because otherwise you're gonna buy the peregrine which will do all, like all recreational diving and it can probably take you down to um, tech 40 without too much issue it's got the same algorithm all that kind of stuff 
Um, but then progressing deeper, if tech really is the direction that you're going, then chances are that you might need that Trimix uh, sort of feature in it, which is what the Perdix uh, is going for. So I'd look more at the gas mixes that can you can input into the computers as opposed to the number of gas mixes that you can put into it. With, um, with different gas mixes, if you're traveling with three gases, that's great. Um, but if you're traveling with five, five separate gas mixes all on a single dive is quite a lot, quite advanced. So um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the, the number of different gases that you're bringing, uh, especially at a sort of Tech 40 level. So the answer is yes, the Peregrine can do it. However, if you're going to progress down the technical diving route, then the Perdix is the way to go. It's going to be the cheaper option in the long run, so you don't buy a, a Peregrine and then have to upgrade to a Perdix in a couple of years' time. So, um, yeah, and look at the, the gas mixes that you can put into it. Um, because the, the Peregrine, I don't know the lower... With, with the Perdix, you can put whatever it is in. Um, it's, it's almost like 1% oxygen all the way up to uh, to 100% uh, oxygen, and, uh, and the same with helium. But with the Peregrine, I don't know the lower limits. I know it can go up to 100% nitrox. Um, that's just kind of a sheer water thing. I'm not sure if it will go down. But, the yeah basically it can do tech 40 uh the peregrine it can take you down there i don't know if it will take you much deeper um it all depends on the uh, the gas mixes that you're going to be using it's um it's quite a complicated question going deeper than that but yeah in in the long run i just go for the uh, the perdix it's um yeah it will be cheaper in the long run it can still do all the recreational stuff as well um it has recreational mode as well so it can get you used to the controls and whatnot and then you can press a button and it unlocks a whole bunch of extra features uh if you do move on to uh, technical diving but um yeah yeah the the peregrine will do what you need it to do but you're kind of coming up to its its limitations as far as what gases you can put into it Keith asks, is the cold water ability of this regulator, this is the, uh, the Apex MTX RC he's asking about, uh, necessary for diving sulfur fisher? Um, so Silfer is in Iceland. Um, it's a beautiful location and it's, it's basically between two tectonic plates. If you ever see that picture of a diver and he's got like two hands up against um, sort of walls, that's, that's it, you can dive um, between two tectonic plates and uh, that's quite cool. Um, but yeah, it's in Iceland, so it's pretty chilly. Um, MTXRC, yeah, this is really its wheelhouse and what it was designed for. The, the MTX range was designed to be, I mean, the, the original one, the, the M is like the military, um, or I presume stands for military, and, um, and they wanted something tough that could go in any environment and just brush off the cold or whatever and be beaten and whatnot. So yeah, MTXRC is the second generation of it, the uh, the recreational side of things. Um, so yeah, it's <clears throat> it lost its NEDU um, certification when it went from the MTXR to the MTXRC, but only because the NEDU basically requires it to not have any adjustability. So on the MTX and the MTX-R, you'll notice there's no um, uh, sort of breathing adjustment on it. With the MTX-RC, you do have that breathing adjustability, um, and that's kind of the only reason why it lost the um, that sort of NEDU tick. It's not the end of the world, <clears throat> but as far as cold water performance, yeah, it, it'll do perfectly fine. This is really what it was designed for. And a lot of the like sort of Arctic divers and cold water divers have transitioned over to the uh, to the MTX range because they're just fantastic. The way that they're designed, they have the over molded uh, sort of rubber caps. So when they literally test the uh, the first stage by holding down that purge button, you can see ice forming on the uh, on the first stage, but it can't get over the top. Uh, because it's got this uh, sort of over molded rubber and all sorts of extra uh, sort of features. So yeah, uh, the MTXRC will do perfectly fine for Silphra. Kusei asks, do you really need two first stage regulators for twin sets? Not really. It's not essential, but it's nice. 
Um, it's nice to have that kind of redundant backup should something go wrong, but no, you can dive with a single first stage if you really want to. Um, there was a documentary years back and uh, it was all about the, um, uh, the US Navy SEALs, how they did their, um, sort of their training, their underwater stuff, and they're diving with twin sets with a single first stage in a central post. Now, the downside to that is something goes wrong with that first stage, that's, that's it, all you really have is just a lot of gas. Whereas if you have two separate first stages, if something happens to one, you still have the other one as a redundant backup. So you can isolate it and just breathe from that one. That's the main reason why divers who dive on twin sets have two separate first stages. And that's why you separate the uh, the hoses that are coming off of each of them and you do have some crisscrossing so that on each first stage you can have one second stage on your right hand post one second stage on your left hand post one way to control your buoyancy on the right one way to control your buoyancy on the left and traditionally just uh, sort of one submersible pressure gauge on the left so you kind of have a completely redundant setup should something go wrong with the first stage or second stage you can switch that one off and you have a completely redundant backup is it essential no but it's nice to have a redundant backup reese asks um how do you equalize wearing a full face mask yeah so when you first see full face masks, it, it kind of it seems like a, a really nice thing and uh, you can breathe through your nose and your mouth and, uh, and it defogs itself, all that kind of stuff. But then when you kind of get down to the, the nuts and bolts of actually diving and, and equalizing, how do you, how, you can't get to your nose. So um, there's a couple of ways around it. The, uh, the main way that they tend to do it is on the inside, and I'll see if I can find some footage from uh, from one, one of my other videos, is that you basically have two little um, silicone plugs um, that sit on the inside of the mask just in front of your nose. They don't actually touch your nose, because uh, that would be annoying throughout the dive. Um, you can control how big they are and uh, how far apart they are, up and down, left and right, and all that kind of stuff. So they sit exactly where you need them to. And then when you need to equalize, you basically touch the uh, the top of the mask and push it up and sort of into your forehead. And that just pushes them up into your nose and it blocks your nostrils so you can equalize against that. Um, some like commercial diving helmets, they'll have like a little post that you push a little bar and it comes across and you kind of push your nose against that. So yeah, on the inside, you'll see there are, are two little um, sort of plugs that sit in front of your nose and you basically manipulate the mask so that it blocks your nose uh, and then you can equalize. Um, yeah, it, it's quite intuitive once you get used to it. Um, or a lot of scuba divers, they just do um, one of the other maneuvers, whether it's, oh, I forget the names, like Frenzel and whatnot, where you kind of yawn and, uh, and that sort of opens up your eustachian tubes. Um, but, um, but yeah, if you do need to pinch your nose and blow, then yeah, that's it. You've got two little plugs on the inside that block your nose. And finally, Manosback asks, uh, someday you should make a video about snorkels. Do you carry a snorkel while scuba diving? Uh, if so, why uh, is a probable title? Yeah, so in all honesty, it's rare that I actually take a snorkel with me on a dive. Um, I always have one in my kit bag, um, but actually on my person whilst I'm diving, especially attached to my mask, that's pretty rare. Um, on the mask, I just find they, they get in the way um, and I don't spend that much time on the surface, sort of surface swimming. Um, but saying that, snorkels do have a lot of use. The main one is, yeah, on the surface. Um, it's a great way of keeping your airway clear um, and keeping the water away from your, uh, your airway so you can still breathe. Uh, even when you're getting back onto the boat, your, your regulator second stage is better because that can go quite deep underwater and still deliver gas. But on the surface, yeah, it's quite nice to have a snorkel. They're quite useful in rescue scenarios. If you need to deliver uh, in-water rescue breaths, 
trying to do si do or get up and over a uh, victim and sort of breathe into their mouth is very tiring very quickly whilst you're towing them and doing equipment removal and all that. Whereas if you put a, um, a pretty basic snorkel, nothing with a, a bottom valve in it, if you put the snorkel in their mouth, one, you're already kind of holding their airway open with one hand, but with the other hand, you can hold that uh, sort of open to the snorkel and you can breathe into their mouth. You've got a decent barrier as well and, um, and deliver those in water rescue breaths without having to get up out of the water and slow yourselves down. You can do it whilst towing. It is all very, um, or a bit more civilized, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I always have one in my kit bag just in case I want to uh, sort of have a snorkel or splash around on the surface when I'm on the dive boat, but uh, actually taking one with me in the water, it's kind of rare. Um, they're not really conducive to stowing them away anywhere. I do know a lot of divers who have like the sort of fold away ones. My one is um, sort of semi rigid. So if it does bend, it's not an issue, but I'm never tempted to, to like bend it and try and stow it in a thigh pocket um, because it's, it's quite rare that I ever go on a dive and I suddenly think, oh, if only I'd had my snorkel. Um, that's quite a rare scenario. So it's nice to have around you but not actually with you on a uh, on a dive and that's it for today um, hopefully i answered all of your questions uh, sufficiently usually i tend to take a, a bit longer but mainly because i'm discussing things with sean and trying to explain stuff to him but uh, but now he's gone these seem to be a lot quicker um but yeah if you have any questions um or even corrections to anything that i've said down below uh let us know down in the comments below if you've got any questions that you want me to answer in the next ask mark try and use the hashtag ask mark just makes it a lot easier for me to find them uh don't forget to head over to simply scuba.com Thank you for watching everybody and of course, safe diving. Yeah.